we'll start the webinar in one moment. Just want to give everyone an opportunity to get admitted in. Start the webinar in one moment here. All right, I am pleased to welcome you all to the ISDS monthly webinar series. My name is Eric Larson. I'm the executive director of the Illinois State Dental Society. Thank you to those joining us live today. ISDS also understands that member schedules and availability differ quite greatly. So today's course will also be offered once it's available and converted to an on-demand format. This is anticipated for availability in the next few days. Courses from prior months are available now on demand and webinars scheduled for future months are also available for registration as well. The goal of ISDS providing these webinars is to help meet the continuing education requirements for your license. Today's course is helping attendees fulfill an Illinois CE requirement for your license renewal. All healthcare professionals, including dentists and dental hygienists, are required to complete a one-hour course in implicit bi bias awareness training each license renewal cycle, which is every three years. Today's course will meet that requirement for your next license renewal. We do have time established for question and answer at the end of today's webinar. So please submit questions via the question and answer feature in Zoom at any point during today's lecture. There is a time tracker built into today's webinar that will certify your attendance for the purposes of issuing a CE certificate you will need to stay logged into the webinar through the end of the question and answer period in order to receive credit for this course. At this time, it is my pleasure to introduce today's speaker. Dr. Gleb helps dentists address bias and serves as the CEO of the consulting firm Disaster Avoidance Experts. Dr. Gleb is the best-selling author of seven books and has published over 650 articles in prominent venues such as Harvard Business Review, Forbes, and Fortune. His clients include Fortune 500 companies ranging from Aflac to Xerox. Dr. Gleb's expertise comes from over 20 years of consulting and training, and Dr. Gleb taught for eight years as a lecturer at UNC Chapel Hill and seven years as a professor, professor at Ohio State University. Now, please give a big round of virtual applause to welcome Dr. Gleb. Thank you so much for the kind introduction, Eric. Welcome, everyone. So let's talk about how you as dentists can overcome implicit bias using behavioral science. This is a very research-driven presentation. You are, of course, coming from a professional research background in terms of your knowledge of science. You have a science-based background, and this is a very science-based presentation. So we'll be really talking about what is implicit bias, what kind of decisions we make, and how those decisions go awry, and the science behind them. The first part of the presentation will talk specifically about a number of ways that we make bad decisions around other people. And this comes from bias, right? Bad decisions come from being biased around others. So making decisions that aren't based on good quality evidence, which as dentists, you always want to make decisions that are based on the evidence. So we'll talk about some of the examples of ways that we make bad decisions around other people. And then in the second part of the presentation, we'll talk about how we can recognize when these ha things happen and how we can address them. So that's the frame of the presentation. That's what you can expect. All right. Now, the first thing I want to talk about is how we make our decisions. How are we taught to make our decisions? Not simply in our professional lives around other people, but in our personal lives and not necessarily even about other people. So let's say that you're driving. Thinking about driving, it's important when you're driving to be confident when you're driving. When you're merging into the highway, it's important to speed up, not slow down. When you're changing lanes, it's important to speed up, not slow down. So thinking about driving, how do, well do you feel you are in your own driving skills? So the first, so we'll be doing some polls and you'll see a poll there. When evaluating your own driving skills, you should be able to see a poll and answer it. Would you say you're in the top half or bottom half of all drivers? 
So top half or bottom half of all drivers, whether you're in Chicago or Springfield or wherever else in Illinois you are, where are you in comparison to other drivers, top half or bottom half? It's about 53% of people participated. Let's give folks another 10 seconds or so. Make sure to participate. You want to get full credit for your participation. Five more seconds. Make sure to vote. All right. So we see that of all the people here, of all the dentists who are attending, 91% are in the top half and 9% are in the bottom half. Now, when you see that, when you think about that, of course, you are mathematical people. You are come from a science-based background. You have to measure things all the time, whether in your business books or various shots that you give people, you have to measure things all the time. And so you realize that's statistically impossible. About half of you should be in the top half and about half of you should be in the bottom half. So why do 91% of you think that you're in the top half? And why do 9% of you think that you're in the bottom half? Well, that's the tendency that we have to make biased decisions. And so this is the first example of a bias called the overconfidence bias. When we judge ourselves or when we judge about other people, when we evaluate ourselves or when we evaluate other people, we have an implicit bias to be overconfident about our judgments. When people say they're 100% confident, they're only right 80% of the time. You bet the house, bet the farm, bet your practice. You're only going to be right 80% of the time on average. And this is a big, big problem. It's especially dangerous for those with more experience and authority. There was a study done on medical doctors, so pretty close to dentists. Medical doctors who were senior doctors who were over 10 years out of medical school and just freshly minted doctors who were just out of medical school. They were given a case study to evaluate and a course of treatment to recommend. And they got the case study right and the course of treatment right at about the same rate for the senior doctors and the junior doctors. Now, even though they got the course of treatment at the same rate correct, the senior doctors were much more confident, much less likely to ask for extra tests. And you might think that, well, why is this the case? Why weren't senior doctors more experienced? Why wouldn't they get right? Well, they got the case of the treatment and the evaluation right because of course they had a lot of experience, but the junior doctors had fresher knowledge coming out of medical school. So junior dentists who are coming out of dental school will often know new things that senior and more experienced dentists don't know about, you know, these new fangled techniques and so on. And so when you think about experience and authority, it's tempting for those with more experience and authority to judge themselves as better, more confident, more accurate, but it's often not the case that they're actually better and more accurate. They are more confident, but being more confident doesn't necessarily say anything about being more accurate. So that's one way that implicit bias comes out in this overconfidence bias. The more fundamental issue is that we make decisions around other people and other decisions, but especially around other people from our emotions. And we really underestimate the role of emotions in our decision-making. So studies show that emotions drive 80-90% of our decisions when we just go ahead and do what naturally comes to us rather than using the techniques that I'll describe in the second half of the presentation if we don't take account of overconfidence bias and other ways that we make bad decisions. The problem is that we tend to go with our gut. We're taught to go with our gut to when we feel confident to believe that the feeling of confidence actually reflects reality. So gurus tell us, go with your gut, trust your intuition, follow your heart, which feels very comfortable. It feels comfortable when we're confident to act confident and believe that we have the right decision. But unfortunately, our gut intuition following it often leads to disastrous decisions because our gut is really not evolved for the modern world. That's the problem. Our intuition, our sense of confidence is evolved for the ancient savannah, not the modern world. 
in the ancient savannah, we lived in small tribes of 50 people to 150 people. So we lived in a tribal society. And a lot of implicit bias has to do with the fact that our minds are have not evolved since the, for that period of time. And think about the rise of the internet, right? The rise of the internet and everything that it has made available has been all essentially one generation since the late 1990s. Do you think we've had time to evolve for the kind of interactions that we have with other people in virtual settings like this one? And even if we don't think about that, let's say the rise of globalization over the last 50 years when we're dealing with people who are very different from us, who come to your dental practice, new technology, and so on. These are not things that people are comfortable with making intuitive decisions that are going to be actually accurate. But we feel that they're accurate. So in the ancient savannah, for example, it was very important to be loyal to your own tribe. Your own tribe was what saved you because you lived in a tribal society. If you weren't sufficiently loyal to your own tribe, your tribe might kick you out. You'd be ostracized and then you'd die. So you notice we're the descendants of those who weren't ostracized and who didn't die. We're the descendants of those who were loyal to our tribe. It's also in that society very important to be hostile to other tribes. If you weren't sufficiently hostile to other tribes, another tribe would take over your tribe and you would die as well. And remember, we descended from those who didn't die. So we are wired to be loyal to those who are in our tribe and hostile to those who are not. Another element here is the fight or flight response to threats. So it was life-saving for hunter-gatherers to make quick snap decisions where risks were immediate, intense in the moment, like saber-toothed tigers. That's the kind of risks they faced. In today's world, that sort of snap judgment and pattern matching is much more dangerous because the risks we face are long-term, uncertain. They might come from a notification on your smartphone about a disease starting up in the middle of nowhere, China, right? And who knew that it would end up disrupting our lives so, so fundamentally? It's not intuitive to be afraid of a disease in nowhere, China. It's much more intuitive to be afraid of saber-toothed tigers. But the problem is that sometimes it's the disease in the middle of nowhere, China, that's much more dangerous. So that relates back to the overconfidence tendency that we have. We make snap judgments, we jump to conclusions, and we don't gather sufficient evidence in order to make good decisions. So that is a huge problem for us. So in terms of good decision-making, that is an issue that you want to be thinking about how you are going to be making your decisions. And so here is where we run into the dangerous judgment errors called cognitive biases, cognitive biases. So cognitive biases, this is the scientific term for what's behind the more colloquial term implicit bias. So implicit bias is a more colloquial term. It refers to ways that we make bad decisions around other people. If you want to look at the science on this topic, you want to look specifically at cognitive biases. So you can look at the list of cognitive biases on Wikipedia. There's going to be a list of over 200. Now, you don't need to learn all 200. I will send an assessment to all those who are interested in a copy of my book that talks about the 30 most dangerous judgment errors for dentists and other professionals to address. So they come from our evolutionary background and how our brains are wired. So our brains are wired to take shortcuts, to not focus on details, to make snap judgments, and again, to be tribal and a number of other tendencies that are quite problematic. So the cognitive biases is the specific term for how our brain is miswired and for how we make bad decisions. Okay, so this is something for you to really be thinking about. This is where, when we talk about bias, the term implicit bias and explicit bias. So again, these are a little bit more colloquial terms, less scientific terms. that are the terms that are widespread in usage. The scientific terminology is going to be around cognitive biases. But what do we mean when we talk about implicit bias versus explicit bias? So cognitive biases, the way that we are mistaken, can come in two forms. Ones that are implicit, 
meaning we don't notice what's going on. And ones that are explicit, where we do know what's going on. So explicit bias is going to be deliberate discrimination around other people, where you deliberately, knowingly discriminate against them. It comes from overt, very open tribalism. Implicit bias, by contrast, is going to be less conscious. It's going to still be there. It's going to be powerful, but without you knowing about this. So cognitive biases generally come out in implicit forms, where you are not aware that you're being overconfident when you make judgments around other people. So this is something for you to really realize how are they are coming out for you. So think about where implicit bias and explicit bias might be problems. Okay, now I want to move on to a topic that a number of you might be thinking about. Not a topic that when you first saw me, I looked like a normal white mainstream American male, but when I started speaking, I obviously have an accent. So a lot of people want to know quickly, they ask me, what am I from? And I'm happy to tell you where I'm from. My dad is Ukrainian. So I used to have to explain what Ukraine was to my American audience. But now, unfortunately, I don't have to, given all the wars that are the, the wars that, that's going on there. So it's been in the news a lot, unfortunately. My mom is Moldovan. So Moldova is a little country to the southwest of Ukraine. So you can see Ukraine is the big blob above Moldova. And Moldova is so tiny that you need an arrow on the map to point to it. My parents came here when Ukraine and Moldova were freed from Russian domination in 1991. I was born in 1981. My parents came here in 1991. And I was really glad that they came as when America was definitely much better than where I lived before. Even as a kid, when I was 10 years old, I knew that. But it was especially enlightening to see a world values survey in 1996, which showed that of all the countries in the world, Moldova, where I was living when, before we came here, Moldova was the least happy. So the least happy country in the world. I don't know why I was just a kid when I left, but that made me especially glad that I, that I left. And I live in Columbus, Ohio, which Columbus, Ohio is not very diverse right now. And it wasn't very diverse ever. But when we first came to the United States, we came to New York City. New York City is very diverse, very multicultural. You walk a block, you hear a dozen different accents. And I didn't try to get rid of my accent because of that. My parents taught me to be proud of my cultural heritage. So I kept my accent. Now, if I came to Columbus, Ohio, where again I live right now, I probably would have tried to give up my accent and try to fit in better, but I didn't. I came to New York. Unfortunately, I learned later that not giving up my accent was kind of a dumb decision because of a tendency called accent discrimination. Talking about implicit bias, this is a tendency to perceive those with accents that are different than yours and especially foreign accents, as less trustworthy. It's a false perception, of course, but that's how people are perceived, because you perceive them as not being part of your tribe. And this has to do with two specific cognitive biases that are sub-elements of the broader tribalism tendency, called the horns effect and the halo effect. The halo effect and the horns effect. What's that about? So the horns effect has to do with somebody having little horns in their head, if someone has an appearance, an accent, a value system, religion, religion, politics, culture, ethnicity, that's different than yours in some significant salient way that you feel marks them out as different than you, then you will tend to feel that that person is less trustworthy and dislike them. So if they have one characteristic that makes it feel like they're not part of your tribe, you'll tend to have two negative view of their other characteristics. Too negative. Now, the halo effect is the opposite. It's like someone has a little halo on their head. And so if you have characteristic and the other person shares a characteristic that's different in some ways than other people around you, if you 
for example, are from, let's say, Mississippi, and you moved to Illinois, and you have a Southern accent, and then you meet somebody else who has a Southern accent, you'll tend to trust that person more than they deserve to be trusted. If you like one characteristic, you'll have too positive view of their other characteristics. It's especially dangerous for business relationships. So you'll definitely tend to see things within a dental practice where people have challenges with others who are different than them and have alignments with people who are similar to them, even though that might not be the right decision making. And you'll see that also playing out in a number of other ways. So for example, if you are thinking about hiring people, that's going to be a major issue. So I'm going to show you an example of that. And this is from a presentation that I gave in 2017 to the HR group, to the HR conference in Columbus, Ohio, where I live right now. And this is an HR conference on implicit bias and diversity, equity, inclusion. And this is a closing keynote for that conference. There's over 100 people on the room. Now, if you know anything about Columbus, Ohio, you probably know it as the home of the Ohio State Buckeyes football team. Fortunately, we just lost that game to Oregon. We were doing pretty well before that. But our biggest rival is the University of Michigan Wolverines, it's the biggest rivalry in college football, or one of the biggest at least. And so there's over 100 people in the room. And I'm going to ask those over 100 people in the room who are here in Columbus, Ohio, whether they will hire a University of Michigan Wolverines fan. Let's see what they say. Will they hire a Michigan fan? So as you know, I'm a professor at Ohio State. I'm contractually obligated to root for the Buckeyes. <laughs> I'm guessing there are a lot of Buckeyes fans here, you know. Go Bucks, right? Oh, yo, there you go. Now, how likely are you to hire a Michigan fan? See, free people. Now, regardless of how we feel about Michigan fans and their poor, poor choices, <laughs> in which team to root for, does that indicate anything about their performance as an employee? No, I know. Come on, that no should be stronger. <laughs> well, hopefully that was revealing. So we saw that there were over 100 people in the room. Only three would hire University of Michigan fan. And it wasn't just an initial impulse. I gave them an opportunity to change their mind. And you saw that they weren't willing to change their mind. Now. When you think of something like sports fandom, that's much less important than people's religion, politics, ethnicity, background. But still, this is very powerful. And again, this is over 100 HR leaders in a conference on diversity, equity, and inclusion. So think about where else and in what other areas it impacts people. Whether when you're thinking about hiring, promotion, when you're thinking about vendors and suppliers, when you're thinking about patients, when you're thinking about anybody else with whom you're working in your dental practice, how powerful do you think this tendency is, the halo effect and the horn effect? So we'll have a question, a poll around that. Do you think there are any negative impacts for, in your workplace from the halo effect or the horns effect? So please go ahead and vote on that question. About 60% participated. Let's give folks 15 more seconds to make their voice heard. Five more seconds. Okay, so by far the large majority of you, 75% of you see some negative impacts in the workplace. So already thinking about the kind of value that you're getting from this webinar, you're already seeing value because you're recognizing, okay, this is a problem. And you can bring this information back to your workplace 
and start doing something about it. You can educate people about the halo importance effect and try to address the negative impacts from it. Great. So let's talk about another tendency that causes us to make bad decisions around other people, the optimism bias and the pessimism bias, the optimism bias and the pessimism bias. When these are kind of like they sound. So these are like the colloquial optimism bias and pessimism bias. Optimism bias has to do with people who see the glass as half full. They see the grass as green on the other side of the hill. So this is people who are like me. I tend to be quite optimistic. These are people who tend to be opportunity oriented, entrepreneurial, creative, but too risk blind. So I've seen lots of dentists who start their own practices rather than working in a practice with somebody else being more optimistic. And by the way, this is not a binary. This is going to be a range. So it's going to be someone who's extremely optimistic, someone who's strongly optimistic, someone who's moderately optimistic, and moderately pessimistic, strongly pessimistic, and extremely pessimistic. So I tend to be strongly optimistic. I see the world as full of opportunities, as the less risk oriented, but I tend to be too risk blind. So that's a problem. And you'll see that also in your patients who wait too long to get various dental work done and they tend to be too optimistic about everything that can go right or wrong with their teeth. The pessimism bias is the opposite. People who tend to work, be great at managing threats, at stabilizing situations and improving them, but they tend to be too risk averse. So again, I see this with dentists who join a practice rather than starting their own practice. And office managers often tend to be in more pessimistic kind of managing the situation. So this is another tendency. And you need to be aware of where you are in the tendency. So if you're making a decision, you really need to make have at least two of each on your team. And of course, the dental practice, you might have difficulty getting two of each on your team. But if you have at least one other person, who is optimistic if you have, if your staff tend to be too optimistic, that's a problem. If your staff to to, tend to be too pessimistic, that's also a problem. So you really want to get somebody on your team who will bring balance to your team. Because if you don't have that balance, you'll tend to make too many bad decisions. So again, this gets a, that another aspect of bias around other people. Now, Another thing that I want to share about is the empathy gap. I see this a lot in terms of how we make bad decisions around other people. Again, we talked about earlier emotions determining up to 90% of our decisions, 80 to 90% of our decisions, when we just go ahead and use the typical tendencies. But we really underestimate the importance of other people's emotions. We tend to feel our own emotions. I mean, I did do see some dentists underestimating their own emotions in impacting their decision-making, certainly. But it's especially the case that they underestimate the importance of other people's emotions. Now, the Savannah environment, it was very important to... Not, it was not very important to look at the emotions of people who are not in our tribe. But that's a problem, because we tend to underestimate the impact of emotions. We tend to assume that people are too rational making their decisions, and that causes us to not predict their decisions and behaviors accurately. So that's the empathy gap. And so thinking about the importance of empathy as a dentist, that is greatly underestimated in terms of how you deal with patients, how you deal with staff, how you deal with vendors and other stakeholders. That's the empathy gap. Now, how can we overcome dangerous judgment errors? You need to learn to go against your intuitions. Our intuitions were great for helping humans survive, but they're not wired for making good decisions in today's world. So thinking about, let's say, if a grateful vendor sends over some donuts to your office and you're passing by those donuts and it's very tempting to take half a donut. And when you take half a donut, you don't want to leave half a donut for somebody else. So you take the other half the donut. And then you tend to, and then you're triggered and you take another donut and another donut. And before you know it, half the box is gone. <laughs> not that it ever happened to me, right? So in the ancient Savannah environment, it was very important for us to be triggered by sugar. 
So when we were triggered by sugar, that was something that caused us to have a sugar rush and have a lot more food, whatever triggered us. In the modern world, that's a bad idea. That's a problem for us. Cause of, there's a reason that causes an obesity epidemic. So much better strategy is to pass by uh, donuts and go for the bowl of fruit that another grateful vendor sent over to the office. Much healthier strategy, much healthier technique. So hopefully you've worked out a strategy for yourself to address some of these problems that cause us to make bad decisions. And this is something for you to be aware of. You've worked out some strategies for yourself to address bad decisions for coming from your gut in your intuitions around eating. But have you done that for your intuitions around decisions around other people? So here I'm going to ask another poll. Are there any areas where you gain benefits from learning to go against your intuition? So thinking about your intuition. Are there any areas where you learn to go against your intuition, whether it's your diet, your exercise habits, or anything else where you learn to go against your intuition? Have you gained any benefits? Please go ahead and vote. Okay, see most people participated, so let's give 10 more seconds. Make your voice heard if you haven't yet. Okay, so yes, of so the vast majority, 93% have areas where you learn to go against your intuition and you gain benefits. Great. So this is another area, the implicit bias, cognitive biases, where you need to learn to go against your intuition. And it will help you to have an assessment that everyone will get, will want a copy of one on dangerous judgment errors in the workplace, which focuses on the 30 most dangerous cognitive biases in professional settings and evaluates how they impact your workplace to give you the next steps to address them. So let's take a look at the assessment. You should all be able to see the assessment now. Here's the directions. Each question refers to a problem that might occur in everyday professional situations. And what you want to do is indicate how often the problem occurred in your workplace in the past year. Just answer in terms of percentage terms out of all the possible times that might have occurred. Don't overthink it. Just aim to go with your initial impression. So that's kind of the approach that you want to take. So. The first question, what percentage of projects missed the deadline or went over a budget? So thinking about the last year, what percentage of projects went over the deadline, went over budget? Take a look at the poll and please go ahead and vote. Is it going to be 50%? Is it going to be 70%? Is it going to be 30%, 90%? Please go ahead and vote. So just over two thirds participated. So let's give 15 more seconds. Please go ahead and make your voice heard. Great. So taking a look at the poll, we see that there's Pretty sizable cluster around the 30 to 50 percent, but there's some who have 90 percent and some who have zero percent. So when you're thinking about this, this is called the planning fallacy. When we think that things will go according to plan, we make a plan, we think that things will go according to plan, and that's kind of a tendency. You've probably heard the phrase that failing to plan is planning to fail. The implication is that when you plan, make a plan, everything will go according to plan, but that's not the reality. Often our plans don't survive contact with the enemy. So a much better phrase that I teach people to use is failing to plan for problems is planning to fail. 
So failing to plan for problems is planning to fail. And here, planning fallacy shows you the range that we have. When we have zero or 10%, it's not too bad. When you're getting into 20%, that becomes more of a serious issue. When you're getting to the 30 and plus percent, that becomes a more really serious issue that you want to address because then you're systematically underestimating the way whatever decision making that you're doing around this topic. So that's a problem. Let's take a look at the next one. Thinking about team conflicts, what percent of team conflicts occurred because someone involved in the conflict overestimated the effectiveness of their communication skills and persuasiveness? So please go ahead and vote. What percentage of team conflicts occurred because someone involved in the conflict overestimated the effectiveness of their persuasion skills and effectiveness of their communication skills? Please go ahead. See, 75% participated. Okay, let's give 10 more seconds. Okay, so we see a little bit more of a tendency to go to the higher range. There are some who are at the 90%, 70%, 60%, some of the other range, so more of a widespread here. So this is the illusion of transparency. There's an illusion that when we communicate, we are effective communicators. And there's a tendency to believe that we are more effective than we actually are. So this is called the illusion of transparency. And we think that when we communicate, we are transparent to others. In reality, let's say we're communicating by video conference, there could be technical glitches, even in person. Someone can be distracted or not hear you. Or maybe there's a different perception of words. What might few mean or several or a couple? People have different perspectives on what those mean. And maybe people hear you, but they don't agree with you, but they don't tell you that they don't agree with you. That happens quite often, especially in power dynamics. So that is another problem. Let's do this one. Of all significant decisions, in what percentage of cases was someone overconfident, at least one person, in the decision? So please go ahead and vote on this one. Someone overconfident about the decision, at least one person. Get 75% participation. Pretty good. Let's go to let's give five more seconds. So we're already pretty high. Great. Okay, so we see more of a widespread and this 50%. And again, in all of these, again, if you have that zero to ten percent, not too much of a problem. 20, it's becoming more of an issue, and 30 and above, it's a serious issue. So you're realizing what issues you're facing here. Let's do one more. When the potential of current employee was evaluated, in what percentage of the situations was the evaluation too positive due to factors not relevant to the job competence organizational fit? And of course, the previous one is about overconfidence bias. So number six, what's the evaluation too positive? What percentage of the situations was the evaluation too positive? Please go ahead and vote on this one too positive of an evaluation. And I definitely see this in dental clinics all the time where there's a reluctance to give accurate evaluations to folks. Okay, 65% participated, so I'll give 10 more seconds. Let's get up to the previous a range of around 80% participation. All right. So we see again, pretty wide dispersal here. So 
pretty significant numbers at 70 and 60, as well as 10 and 20. So pretty significant. So clearly this is a problem. And this, of course, has to do with the halo effect. When you are too positive with button employee, when the situation doesn't call for somebody for you to be that positive about an employee. Okay, so hopefully this again is a great way to address some of the issues by helping you and others recognize what's going on. So what I recommend is that you you'll get a copy of the assessment, take the assessment yourself, and have the everyone else in your practice take the assessment, and then have a discussion with each other about what tendencies you recognize and what tendencies they recognize. And then you'll be able to address these tendencies effectively. So that's the way that you would use the assessment. A great tool for addressing the implicit bias, the cognitive biases that underline implicit bias. All right, what about addressing these problems? So there are five questions that you can use to avoid decision disasters when you make decisions around other people. And this is a quick, quick technique that you can use. Once you learn these five questions, it's very easy to use them to avoid decision disasters. You're not gonna make necessarily the perfect decision by using the five questions, but you'll avoid the large majority of disastrous decisions if you use these five questions. And it's a great tool to use by yourself when you're thinking about other people. It's also, if you're trying to make a decision with a team, you have everyone answer the questions in advance of a meeting and then come to the meeting and just work through the five questions one by one as you're making the decision. So five questions to avoid decision disasters. First, what important information didn't I yet fully consider? So what evidence did you take into account? We tend to not take into account evidence that goes against our intuitions, against our beliefs. So you really want to weigh that evidence much more heavily than you intuitively do. You also want to think about what information is important. I've seen a number of dentists be struck down by analysis paralysis and look for trivial information. So you really want to decide what information is actually important for making a decision around someone. Second, what dangerous judgment errors didn't I yet address? So you can think about the halo effect, the horns effect. If you're thinking about other people, if you're make, thinking about a project, you can think about the planning fallacy. What would a trusted and objective advisor suggest they do? So think about somebody who is a mentor, somebody who you trust, someone who's kind of like an angel on your shoulder. What would they suggest you do in the situation? You get a lot of the benefit by just thinking of this person. And you, of course, get the rest of the benefit by calling the person or if you're under 30, texting this person. Now, the first three questions have to do with making the decision. But if you don't implement the decision well, you're not really going to have a good outcome. So fourth question is, how have I addressed all the ways the decision can fail? So thinking about failure, how can you address all the problems with the decision? How can you address all the ways this can fail? And of course, once you decide there are a number of ways that this decision can fail, you can fix the problems in advance. And finally, what new information would cause me to revisit this decision? What would cause you to change your mind about this decision. We tend to be stuck with a decision after we make it, but if we decide in advance that, hey, we have some, here's what will cause us to make, to change the decision, that's going to be very helpful for you to avoid being stuck with the decision. So let's think that you're making a typical hire. You're hiring a person for your practice. What important information didn't I yet fully consider? I tend to see dentists not calling references nearly often enough. And maybe some dentists think that, well, they'll just say a few things about this person, but you can ask specific questions. You can ask for their specific behaviors. You can ask for what kind of a culture would this person be a fit for? And there are definitely different dental practices of different cultures. So that's a way that you can get information. What dangerous judgment errors didn't they yet address? Think about from a Hale and Horns perspective. Are they similar to you in some ways? Are they different than you in some ways? So think about where you might be making bad decisions there. What would a trust and objective advisor suggest I do? So describe your interview process and evaluation of this candidate to somebody you trust and ask their perspective. How have I addressed the ways this could fail? A way I've often seen hires fail is that they don't get sufficient mentoring. So make sure to early on provide that person with a mentor to get them integrated effectively into your practice. And finally, what new information would cause me to revisit this decision? So you can have 
a 360 degree review where you talk to the people who this person interacts with most before at the one, two and three month stage. So at the one month stage in 30 days, you can still give them feedback and help them improve. And it's the same thing at the 60 month, the 60 day stage and the three month stage, you can make a final decision whether you want to keep that person around. That's how you would apply this to hire. And you can apply this to any question that you can ask. Now, given that, how valuable would it be for you and your team to learn to use this technique to make good enough decisions? Go ahead and vote. Excellent. Oh, most people participated, so let's give 10 more seconds. All right. So yeah, so clearly everyone would find it valuable. That's great to hear, excellent. And you'll all get a copy of whoever wants, will get a copy of a questionnaire, will get a copy of a decision aid on this technique. Wonderful. Okay, so key takeaways. Tribalism causes us to favor those in our in-group without realizing it. So that's really something for you to be thinking about when you're thinking about implicit bias. Don't trust your gut about decisions on people that you don't want to screw up. So you don't want to screw up a decision on someone, don't trust your gut. Use the assessment to learn about and address these cognitive biases, which are all involved within the broader category of implicit bias, and use the five questions technique to make good enough people decisions quickly and effectively. Okay. Now, if you're watching this on the recording, to get the free additional resources that I'll talk about, you should go to tinyurl.com forward slash DAE event. So again, for those who are watching this on a recording, not those who are present here, those who are present here, you'll have a poll. But if you're watching this on the recording and you want the resources that I'll share about, go to tinyurl.com DAE event, tinyurl.com forward slash DAE event. And that's going to be under my picture. So you should be able to see it on your screen. So tinyurl.com forward slash TAE event. You'll get a coaching session. So I have a coaching session, three slots open, first come, first serve. Now you'll get a copy of my best selling book, The Blind Spots Between Us How to Overcome Unconscious Cognitive Bias and Build Better Relationships. And I'll also send you a decision aid with the five key questions and a copy of the assessment, as well as a copy of the slides. All right, so for those who want these, please go ahead and vote in the poll, whether you would like them or not. Please go ahead and vote. And in the meantime, I'll be happy to take any questions at this stage. Thank you for a great presentation, Dr. Gleb. Um, we'll take any questions through the question and answer feature in Zoom, so go ahead and type those um, if, if there are any. All right, we'll give a few moments here to see if there are any questions that do come through. Um, otherwise, Dr. Glove, I don't know if you have any um, Closing words of wisdom. Um, uh, and let's see if folks have any questions. Yeah, it looks like it looks like there is one here that came through. Um, the question is, what is the biggest bias, or maybe most common form of bias that you mm -hmm. found in dentistry? I'd say the overconfidence bias has been the biggest challenge. That people you've seen the first question that people make decisions very quickly without gathering sufficient information. And it's understandable. Dentists are busy people. You have a lot of things that are on your plate. 
but some decisions are really worth it to take the time to do the five key questions, to really think about other people and not to just follow pattern matching habits. And it really causes a lot of problems down the road if you're overconfident and don't gather enough information and jump to conclusions way too quickly. So that's the biggest challenge I found in the industry. Uh, it looks like somebody typed a partial question. So I'll kind of wait to see if there's another one. Um, we do have another question that came through just now. Um, have you been an expert witness in any law cases? Yeah, absolutely. So uh, let me do, I can share my expert witness directory. So you can see my information in this expert witness directory. If you want to check out, just Google seek expert witness directory, Gleb Tsipurski, and you'll see, of, well, you can just Google expert witness, Gleb Tsipurski, this should come up. So th this is discrimination expert in employment, fair housing. So this is the kind of things you know, that I specialize in. Employment law, termination, law enforcement, jury selection, police procedures, bias, decision-making, discrimination, implicit bias, and conscious bias recruitment, and so on, racism, sexism, public procurement. So this is uh, the kind of things that I work on. Yep. And Thank you for sharing that. It looks like there was kind of a follow-up uh, part two question from the same mm -hmm. individual um, in terms of cases, like what have you seen in terms of cases and settlement or awards issued in those types of cases? Right. So what I tend to look for is a very science-based approach. So you can look for articles. I've written articles for law journals. So for example, I've written an article for the Illinois Bar Journal about cognitive biases. And there is going to be some information around settlements and the awards there. So it will really just depend on the case. If you have, let's say, discrimination case in employment, that's going to be one type of settlement that it's going to be depending on the kind of severity and how long it's been going on. The more severe it is, the longer it's been going on, the more impact it has, then the more of a problem it is. And so you, it, it really depends on the kind of specific case. And of course, you'll have the more egregious it is, the more the public perceives it to be a problem, the bigger an award it will be. So I recommend that you take a look at my article in the Illinois Bar Journal on this topic. I think it should be freely accessible and that should give you some information. Thank you. Um, looks like another question here, you may or may not be able to answer, but is there research that draws parallels between decision-making in office slash employee management and clinical decision-making? Sure. So I gave you an example at the beginning around overconfidence in terms of the overconfidence bias and how it applies to doctors. And of course, it applies to dentists. And you have similar research showing that it applies to business leaders as well in terms of office management and so on. So that's just about the overconfidence bias. We see the same sort of evaluations going on in terms of other biases, where there's research on dentists, research in hospitals, as well as research on business settings. Thank you. And then there's another question. It's, um, do you have any recommendations for dealing with bias uh, by patients against staff or the doctor, dentist in our case? Yeah, so that's very hard to deal with when you have bias by, the, by a patient. And it's not really something that you can control, unfortunately. You can only control your employees it's like when I talk to dentists and I talk to hospitals and I work with them, you know, you can't really control bias by patients. You can do a little bit of patient education. You can talk about, you can have signs in your dental practice about this being an inclusive practice and that will help convey the culture. So the inclusiveness, inclusion, that helps somewhat, but that's not really something that you can control too much their behavior. The things that you can really control is your own behavior and those of your employees. So you can have messaging toward patients, but the main things that you can do is control your employees and yourself. Sure. And then another attendee today asked, 
have you looked at gender bias in your research? Yeah, absolutely. It's definitely an issue. So, and it's something that we do see in dentistry where you'll have working color men being discriminating somewhat against dentists who are female, as an example, and dental technicians. So you'll there's definitely going to be some issues around gender bias as an issue, including within the dental field. So it's something to just be aware of. So as you're thinking about if you're a woman and you're thinking about where to situate your practice, if you are situating within a blue collar neighborhood, you are likely to face some discrimination if you're going to be serving the male population. Thank you. Um, we'll wait on a few more questions if there are any. Um, currently, we don't have any. Kind of give it one more moment here. And then if, if none, we can go ahead and wrap up. All right, not seeing any coming through. Um, Dr. Gleb, thank you um, for presenting on this topic today. Don't know if you have any closing comments, closing remarks to kind of wrap up today's webinar. So just really be thinking about the kind of decisions that you're making and you have very clear next steps. You'll be getting a copy of my assessment if you want it and the decision aid, a copy of my book. I have a coaching session open. So really think about how you can integrate these techniques into your practice. You know, the point of attending this is so that you can make better decisions around others and you want to really take concrete and specific steps to help you do so. So I could recommend that you do so and try to make sure to make good decisions and go against your intuition around other people. Thank you so much and thanks again for joining us. Thanks all.